become known by great authority for kingdoms as far as eyes can see in royal robes they rule from thrones waging wars they overthrow the weak call it victory my King is known by mercy. My King is known by grace. For the hope in His name and the power that saves. My King is known by the cross. My Well, good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church Jacksonville, where our mission is to reach all of Jacksonville with all of Jesus for all of life. 
We are so glad you're here this morning to worship the risen Jesus Christ with us this morning. It is a joy to be together. I just want to, for a moment, draw your attention to the back of the pew. There's a car that says Next Steps on it. Whether you are a first-time guest with us or a long-time member, I want to encourage you to fill this out this morning with whatever your next step is. Whether that's learning more about Jesus, wanting to join the church and membership, finding a place to serve, or even just having a prayer request you want to pass along. I want to encourage you just to fill that out on the way after, uh, out of the service this morning. You can drop that off with a pastor or a counselor at one of our Next Step stations. And for those joining us online this morning, you can fill out a digital version at fbcjacks.com slash next steps. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to use this service, both for his glory and for our good this morning. And Father, we come to you this morning as your people, and we come as your people to proclaim a crucified Savior, and we come to proclaim a risen Savior. And we've come to proclaim your power and your grace and your mercy and the forgiveness you offer because of Jesus Christ. And we want people to know, Father, the power you have to save and to sanctify. We pray, Father, this morning, through the preaching of your word, through the singing of your word, through the praying of your word, and through the reading of your word, all those things might be the means you use to exalt Jesus Christ, both in our hearts and in our lips and the lives that we live as we leave this place this morning. We thank you for all these things. We pray that you be honored in them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, and welcome to our service of worship this morning. It's good to be together and be able to sing together. And it's an opportunity we have to proclaim our devotion and affection for Jesus Christ. You'll just hear throughout the service, we're unashamedly all about Jesus and I want to call us to worship uh, from His words uh, in John chapter 11. Here we encounter the conversation He's having with Martha. And we know a lot about Martha already because she's one that has been known to be worried and troubled about many things. And like Peter, she becomes known for that more than anything else, a negative instead of the positive thing that she is about to say here. So here are the words of Jesus and her reply in John 11. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I have come to believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, and he who comes into the world. Well, I hope that's your confession this morning as well, that you've come to believe that He is the Christ, the Son of God, the one who was promised and the one who came. And so we have the opportunity to make that confession musically now through a hymn, Christ Our Hope in Life and Death. Let's stand and sing this together, this hymn of confession.
amen. We have the privilege to gather, to gather, and to proclaim with one voice these incredible words that Christ is our hope, both in this life and in the one to come through our death. And so as we think of that, we think about the death that he died on our behalf, him giving himself upon the cross, buried, and then raised again on the third day. We have one confession then, that we trust in him and we live for him. So as we sing this next song, let it be a reminder of where he brought you from and a, pr a promise of where he's leading you to. All I have is Christ. <laughs>
chorus, please. Amen. What a wonderful proclamation and devotion. We continue in worship as Jamie Vaughn comes to lead us in our scripture reading. Good morning. Please read with me 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. May God bless the reading of his word. Good morning. You can be seated. It is so great to be here with you worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. That uh, passage that Jamie just led us in reading, actually it might surprise you to learn that that is a passage of scripture that is about money. It is about money, and what the Apostle Paul is doing in 2 Corinthians 8 is he's making an argument that you need to be giving your money to the kingdom of God for the advancement of the church. And he wants you to do that generously, and he wants you to do that cheerfully. And the foundation for the argument is what Jesus Christ did. Jesus Christ, as the King of kings and Lord of lords, as the Son of God, He had all power and all glory, and He gave it all up as He died on the cross so that we who are poor could benefit from His riches. And the argument in the rest of the chapter is that we ought to be generous as Jesus has been generous. Not generous as Jesus has been generous as though to pay back a debt, as if such a thing were possible. It's not about paying a debt. Jesus has given us something that can never repaid, be repaid, but it's about following his example. It's about the fact that when Jesus Christ has engaged in the most generous act imaginable, the giving of his own life, you can't follow him in faith and in hope and not be generous in the same way. It is because of that that one of the five things that we ask each of our members to do uh, because the New Testament requires it, is to give. We ask you to give to our church. We ask everybody to do it, but that's probably the most controversial of the five that we ask. But we ask it because Jesus commands it. We ask it because Jesus demonstrates it. And today, at the conclusion of our service, we're going to have a business meeting, and we are going to ask you to approve a budget uh, that we have been working on for months. It's a budget that has us investing almost $11 million into the kingdom of God next year. We're going to ask you to do that at the end of the service, but that's not the most important thing we're asking you. We're asking you to be a part of supplying that budget. We're asking you to be invested in that budget, uh, to have your life and your sacrifice be a part of that almost $11 million in contributions. Uh, why? because Jesus commanded it. That's one answer, and that's a pretty good answer. But an even better answer, why, is because Jesus demonstrates. Jesus demonstrates kingdom sacrifice, and he demonstrates it to us. And so, as followers of the one who gave everything for us, I'm going to pray that he would equip us to give some for him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for Jesus. We're thankful for his life of sacrifice that buys us back from every sin. And I want to pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ who are listening to me as we pray together. I want to ask that you would work in our hearts to lead us to be invested in that which Christ would have us to be invested, and that is the kingdom. That is the church. I pray that you would make us generous givers, and Father, I pray in Christ you'd make us cheerful givers. In Jesus' name, amen. Our faith in Jesus Christ is not contingent upon our ability to cling to Him, but in His ability to hold us. He is the anchor that holds within the veil, and uh, He is the one that is the, the solid rock upon which we stand. So we will make our confession 
through a hymn called Christ, our, the sure and steady anchor as we think about what he has accomplished on our behalf. And let's stand together as we sing together this hymn.
Praise the Lord for the rock. You may be seated. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 20. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 20. One of the things that happens when you are a church that is committed to preaching through books of the Bible, as we are, one of the things that happens is you uh, regularly at times uh, come upon these texts of Scripture that are famous and influential and well-known and have had a great impact in so many people's life. We, we come to a text like that this morning, and in fact, when I was about this time last year setting the preaching schedule for this year, uh, I was looking at this and thinking about it and praying about it, and I assigned a Sunday, this Sunday, uh, for this text. And when I started looking at it to prepare to preach here uh, a while back, I realized that that might be one of the most significant mistakes I've made as the senior pastor of this church. Because I looked at it, I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do this text in one week. There's like a three or four part sermon series here. But it is what it is. So I just want to let you know that we're going to do the best we can to uh, uh, tackle uh, this incredible passage of great consequence in the time that we have together, but we're going to need the Lord's help for sure. But as we come to Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 20, this is what God says. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist and others, Elijah, but still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter and upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. Let's pray. Father, the most important thing that could happen is the most important thing that must happen. We need Jesus Christ to come into our hearts and our church and our city in a special way, in a unique and in a powerful way that is uncommon and shocking. We, we need that to happen. And the only way that is going to happen is if you begin to show people that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Father, that is work that we can't do. And so you today will, will just need you to demonstrate your power by overcoming the sins and weaknesses of a preacher like me. 
by overcoming the sins and weaknesses of the people who are listening, by overcoming distractions. Father, we need you to use the spirit of Christ who inspired these words that we have just read to give power to these words and change us and to show us what we haven't seen, to help us to know what we haven't learned. Father, would you awaken our hearts and show us Jesus? We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I wanna talk to you this morning about the most important question in the world. It is a question that everything depends on. It's a question that life and death depends on. It's a question that defines your whole life and existence. And that question is the question, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Jesus is a crucial person to figure out. There is nobody in history that is more well-known, nobody in history more influential, nobody in history more controversial and debated than Jesus Christ is. And so who is Jesus? It's the most important question in the whole world. And there are some wrong answers to the question. In the life and ministry of Jesus, we discover people who don't think much of Jesus. They don't like who he is, they don't like what he's doing, they don't like what he says about who he is, and they confront him and reject him and actually declare war on him. Some of those people give wrong answers. Some of them even say that he's the devil, and he's in league with the devil. They say bad things about Jesus and give the wrong answer to the most important question because they don't like Jesus. There there are people like that who are listening to me right now. You don't think much of Jesus. For whatever reason, you don't like who he is, you don't like what he says, and you give wrong answers to that most important question. There's some wrong answers to the question. There are some really close answers. There's some answers that get so close. We actually see close answers in the passage that we just read. Jesus Christ asks... Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And we get close answers. Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Some say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Now, strictly speaking, the answer's wrong because Jeremiah and John the Baptist are both dead. Elijah is in heaven. So strictly speaking, those answers are wrong, but The people who are saying this, they're getting warmer. They're getting closer. In fact, when you look at Jesus' earthly ministry right up until the very end, most people didn't dislike him. Most people actually were amazed at him. And there's actually a great lesson in it that for the most part, when you are around Jesus and when you get close to Jesus, you're going to say good and positive things about Jesus. These folks are saying good and positive things about Jesus. They've been close to Jesus, and the only explanation they have for somebody being able to say what he's saying and do what he's doing is something miraculous has to be going on here. There has to be a powerful prophet that has been reincarnated, that has been resurrected from the grave. That's the only way we can explain this, some righteous resurrection of a prophet. They're getting close. There there is something miraculous. There is something wonderful in the life and ministry of Jesus. They they see it and they're so close. And there are people listening to me right now who are so close, so close. You think Jesus is a great teacher. You think Jesus has had a wonderful and a powerful impact on history. Jesus is the person you know that your parents are really committed to. And your parents are halfway decent people. Jesus is the person that when your kid got to know Jesus, their life turned around and improved for the better. And so Jesus, there's got to be something good about the guy if he did that. So close, so close, but not there. There are some wrong answers. There's many close 
answers, but there's only one right answer. That one right answer is recorded for us by the Apostle Matthew from the lips of the Apostle Peter. Peter is confronted with the most important question in the world. Who is Jesus? Who am I? Who do you say that I am? Jesus asks Peter. And Peter gives the one right answer. You, he says. Jesus, are the Christ. You're the son of the living God. That's the one right answer to the most important question that everybody has to figure out. And what Peter does as he answers it that way is he actually answers the most important question in two parts. First, he says, you are the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. A lot of people think that Christ is Jesus' last name, Jesus Christ, Mr. Christ. (laughs) But Christ actually isn't Jesus' name, it's Jesus' title. It's talking about what he came to do. If if Jesus had a business card, his name would say Jesus, and underneath the description, it wouldn't say CEO or CFO or whatever it would say, Christ. Jesus is the Christ. And the Christ is the anointed one of God. The Christ is the Messiah. In John chapter 1, verse 41... The Bible says, he found first his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. To say that Jesus is the Christ is to say that he is the Messiah. To say that Jesus is the Messiah is to say that he is the anointed one of God. To say that Jesus is the anointed one of God is to say that Jesus has been appointed and sent by God to do a work. What it means to be anointed and appointed and sent by God to do a work goes all the way back to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there are three different offices that were anointed. There was the office of the priest, and it was the job of the priest to be a mediator, to stand in the breach between God and man, and the priest represented God to the people. And the priest also represented the people to God. He was a mediator. That was one office that was anointed. There was another anointed office in the Old Testament. It was the office of prophet. And the office of the prophet was to stand before the people of God and declare the word of God. The prophet's most famous utterance was, thus says the Lord. And when the prophet got done speaking, you knew what God thought. There's a third office that was anointed by God, and that was the office of king. And the king sat over the people of God and ruled and reigned as God's representative leader. And so prophet, priest, and king are the three Old Testament offices that are anointed. And the way those officials would be anointed was regularly to have oil poured over their heads. And this would be a public demonstration of setting apart for their work of anointing. That was their anointing. And now you can go be living out your office of prophet, priest, and king. We fast forward to the New Testament and to Jesus' ministry. Here he is called the Christ. And what it means for Jesus to be the Christ is not just to be a priest, though he is a priest, but he's more than a priest. He is a priest and a prophet, but he's not just a priest and a prophet. He's more than that. He is a prophet and a priest and a king. Jesus Christ is in one person. He is all three offices. Jesus comes as the anointed one of God who is prophet and priest and king. And Jesus, when he is anointed, is not anointed with oil. 
as these other people were. He was set apart and he was anointed. But he wasn't anointed with oil. We read about his anointing in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, in his baptism. In Matthew 3, 16, after being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. Jesus Christ comes as prophet and priest and king and when he is anointed, it is not with oil, but the heavens are opened and the Spirit of God descends and rests on Jesus. Jesus is anointed with the powerful Holy Spirit to do the work that God has sent him to do. When, when Peter says, you are the Christ, he means you're sent by God to be prophet, priest, and king, and you've been anointed by the Holy Spirit for your work. We said, though, that Peter's answer is a two-part answer. You are the Christ. That's the first part. The second part is that you are the son of the living God. When we say that Jesus is the Christ, we're talking about his title. When we say that Jesus is the Son of God, we're talking about who Jesus is in his very essence. Who he is in himself, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, other people in the Bible are called sons of God. Read the Old Testament, God's people, Israel are called his son or his sons. There are times in the Old Testament when certain kings are said to be sons of God or David my son. You get to the New Testament and you find out that Christians, people who have turned from their sins and trusted in Jesus, we are called sons of God. So there are times in the Bible where you encounter sons of God, but Jesus is not called one of the sons of God, he is called the son of God. Jesus is the Son of God uniquely in a way that is true of no one else. And the most common way the Bible talks about Jesus as the Son of God is the way John 3.16 says it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That's the most common way that the Bible talks about the uniqueness of Jesus' sonship, that he is the only begotten son. Jesus is unique. There is nobody who comes from the Father the way Jesus does. He is his only begotten. He's, he's not born from God. He is begotten of God. He comes from God uniquely and differently than absolutely anybody else. When Jesus says, I am the son of God, when Jesus says, God is my father, he means it differently than anybody else who could ever say that. And actually, Jesus' enemies know it. They know when Jesus says, I'm the son and he's my father, they know he means something different. In fact, in John chapter 5, verse 18, the Bible says, For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but he was also calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. This guy's calling God his father. That means he's saying he's of the same essence as the father. That means he's saying he's God. And Jesus agrees with them. In John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus Christ, the son of God, will say shockingly, I and the father are one. We're of one essence. God is saying, That Jesus is the unique, only begotten Son of God means we are accountable to Him like we are accountable to no one else. It means He defines our life like no one else can or should define our lives. In Genesis, uh, Galatians, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, the Apostle Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. What it means that Jesus Christ is the Son of God is that all of us who have looked at his life and seen that he was perfect and never sinned, 
All of us who have looked at his death and see that he bled on the cross to pay for our sins. All of us who have looked at his resurrection and see that he powerfully came forth from the grave as the resurrected king. All of us who have looked at that and turned from our sins and trusted in him now must say that Jesus Christ as the unique, only begotten son of God now controls my life. And the life I live is not my life anymore. But my life is lived by faith in the Son of God. Only Jesus, as the Son of God, makes the claim on your life that everything about you is now controlled and defined by me. When the Apostle Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of God, that's what he means. He means that Jesus is sent by God to be prophet and priest and king, anointed by the Holy Spirit to save people from their sins and now to control their life as God come in the flesh. That's the one right answer. That's the one right answer to the most important question in the world. And what I want you to see over just the next few minutes is that that one right answer to that most important question actually becomes the entire focus of the history of salvation. It becomes the entire focus of the whole wide world. And it becomes the whole focus of your life. This answer to this most important question is the focus of salvation history. In, in the history of God saving a people for himself, this confession right here is the focus of it. A lot of people say that this moment in the life and times of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew is actually the pinnacle of the book. I actually think you can go further and say this is the pinnacle of salvation history, this moment. This is one of those climactic events in the history of salvation. And what happens here is as Jesus poses the question, who do you say that I am? Most important question in the world. And as Peter responds, you're the Christ, the son of the living God, with the one right answer, Jesus' response is one of great enthusiasm. Jesus is very excited about what Peter has said. Simon Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter tells Jesus who he is. And now Jesus is going to tell Peter who Peter is. Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, son of Jonah, son of John, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Jesus is saying, Peter, you figured this out and you figured it out with help. You didn't do this on your own. You can't do it on your own. Because the whole reason the Son of God has to come into the world to save people is because we're dumb and lost and dead. And so something has to happen to wake us up to see the truth as it is. And Jesus is saying that happened in Peter's life, that the work of God the Father operated in his heart so that his eyes opened and he saw the truth. I also, verse 18, say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church in the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Jesus is very excited about this answer. He's going, Peter, that's right. Your answer has the approval of heaven because the Father showed you this. And upon you and your confession, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. And even hell itself isn't going to prevail against what's going to happen after this. Jesus is in a very good mood about what Peter has just said. Now, why? Why has Peter been so able to make Jesus overjoyed with an enthusiastic response? What's going on? Well, to, to understand the answer to that question, you do have to understand something of salvation history. So God makes the world, God makes the world perfect. God makes people, he makes people perfect. And then people mess it up. Adam and Eve take all this perfect, beautiful glory of the garden and they sin against God. And in response to their sin, God pronounces a curse. But in the curse, he folds in a blessing. In the curse, he folds in hope. In the curse, he folds in a promise. Even as he's cursing the people, he lets them know that it's not always going to be this way. 
In Genesis chapter 3, 15, he promises a deliverer that's going to come and make all this bad stuff reverse. In Genesis 3, 15, God says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. There is a deliverer coming. He's going to crush the head of the serpent that created all this damage. He's going to get hurt in the process. His heel's going to get banged up, but he's going to crush the head of the devil. There's a promise that a deliverer is coming. As salvation history continues to advance, he lets us know that this salvation is going to affect all of the nations of the world through Abraham. In Genesis 12, 3, I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Abraham, through you, a deliverer is coming. And he's not going to just help your family. And he's not going to just help your nation. He's going to deliver everyone in the world. He's going to impact all the nations of the earth. Salvation history continues. And Abraham's people, the Israelites, get locked up in Egypt. And they are delivered by the mighty power of God through the work of the prophet Moses. And God promises through Moses that more work is going to happen. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18, I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you, Moses, and I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. There's going to be a deliverer. He's going to come. He's going to be a prophet like you. And he's going to tell my people my words and what to think. And salvation history continues and the kings come along. And David, who has a heart after God's, gets a promise from God. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16, God says to David, Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. David, there's going to be somebody from your family sitting on the throne forever. Not because people are going to keep giving birth to babies forever and forever and forever, but one day, One of your children's children's children is going to have a baby who will live forever. There's going to be a deliverer, David. He's going to come and he's going to reign as king forever. And this baby that's going to be born isn't going to be just any regular baby. But the prophet Isaiah promises us as salvation continues. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, the Lord himself will give you a son. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son and you'll call his name Emmanuel. A deliverer is coming. You'll know when he shows up because he's going to be born of a virgin. And when that virgin gives birth to that baby, you will be able to call that baby God with us. The prophet Jeremiah, as the years are getting longer and longer and the wait is getting harder and harder, the prophet Jeremiah promises that there is more coming. Good things are going to yet happen in Jeremiah 31, 33, but this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and on their heart I'll write it and I'll be their God and they shall be my people. There's a deliverer coming. He's going to put the law of God on your heart and he's going to make you truly God's people and God himself is going to truly be your God. He tells the prophet Ezekiel, He says, hey, look, keep hoping. One day this deliverer is going to come and he's going to take out your hard heart of stone that loves to disobey. And he's going to sprinkle clean water on you and he's going to give you a soft heart of flesh that loves to follow God. It's coming. Just wait. The deliverer is on his way. He tells us through the prophet Malachi, here's how you'll recognize he's coming. In Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. You'll know the deliverer because someone like Elijah is going to come and preach that he's coming. Hundreds and hundreds of years of prophecies that this deliverer is coming and nothing. And then it gets worse. It's quiet for 400 years. No deliverer, no even promises. It's quiet. But one day, in a little hick town in the north part of Israel, an angel appears.
appears to that virgin that Isaiah promised. And the word spreads. In Matthew 1.21, she will bear a son, and you'll call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Here is the virgin. The deliverer is coming, and then he's born unceremoniously to be sure, but in fulfillment of the promise to Abraham that all the nations of the earth will be blessed through this man. Really, really wise men from all over the world come together, these wise men, and they worship this deliverer. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. The deliverer's come. He's a baby, but the wise men know enough to worship him when they see him. And then, not just the wise men, but the forerunner of the deliverer comes. John the Baptist shows up in the spirit and in the power of Elijah, and he says in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, as for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And then the deliverer is baptized. The Spirit descends on him. And then the deliverer begins his ministry. He starts doing what he came to do in Matthew Chapter 4, verse 23, Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. He's doing what we've been able to see him doing as we've been studying the life and times of Jesus in Matthew, and he's preaching with power that he's the fulfillment of the law, and he's healing with power as every disease is healed. And Jesus actually single-handedly eradicates illness in the ancient world for a season. And then the deliverer stands, and he gives what is his ultimate and climactic command. In Matthew chapter eleven twenty-eight, 28, this deliverer that we've been waiting for, that we're now seeing that we're hearing. He says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. You've been working to try to save yourself by your own strength all these long years, and now it's time to rest in me. The deliverer has come, and if you'll come, you'll be forgiven, and you'll find rest forever. All of this buildup, all of this work, all of this ministry, and opinions have been varied. Some Wonderful, but not quite right. Some bad, some lethal. But after all of this buildup, after all of this time, after all of this long wait, now on a hillside in the country, in Caesarea Philippi, all of redemptive history zooms in on a conversation between two people. The deliverer is there. And he looks at Peter. And he says, Peter, do you know who you're talking to? Have you been paying attention to what the prophets have been saying? And Peter looks at him. And God the Father opened his heart to believe what he saw. And he looks and says, staring in the face of the deliverer, you are the Christ. You are are the son of the living God. This moment is the culmination of the hopes and the fears of all the years. We've been waiting and nobody has gotten it quite right until now. And that is why Jesus is thrilled because the moment we've all been waiting for is here and Peter becomes the very first Christian. And in that moment, Jesus starts to build his church. And he's been building it right up until now, right up until today. Jesus is building his church based on this confession. When you preach Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, people will believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And there's no force in the world that can stop it. There's no force in hell that can stop it. And you say, well, you don't know how hard-hearted my 
daughter or son or mom or dad or brother or aunt is, Jesus is going to build his church. It doesn't matter how hard-hearted they are. And you say, well, that sounds pretty optimistic. I was watching the news before I came in here this morning. The culture's going downhill fast. It doesn't matter. Jesus is going to build his church. And you say, well, I don't know. It seems so bad now that COVID's gone and Barna says 35% or some odd are never coming back to church. And I don't think it's ever going to be the way it was. And it won't. But Jesus is going to build his church. This is a promise. This is who Jesus is and what he does. This is how the church stands and how the church grows no matter what. It's been growing until now and it'll keep growing until Jesus comes back. The answer to this question is the focus of salvation history. The answer to this question is the focus of world history. You might think this most important question only involves people who are connected with God's Old Testament people, Israel. Or it only involves Christians, you know, the church types. But the Bible makes very clear that the answer to this most important question is the focus of the entire world. Every human being alive or who has ever lived or who will ever live is going to have to answer this question. The answer to this question, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, is about the future of the whole world. In 1 John 4, 14, the Bible says, we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. There is no way to be saved. There is no way to escape the death trap of this world but by the name of Jesus. It doesn't matter if you're Buddhist. It doesn't matter if you're agnostic. It doesn't matter if you're atheist. It doesn't matter if you're Islamic. There is only one way, and it is by confessing the one right answer to the most important question, Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And every human being that has ever drawn breath will ultimately have to contend with the answer to this question. Jesus will prove that when the trumpet blasts, when the skies rip apart, every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son, the Lord. All of the whole world history is building up to this, and there's no way around it. The answer to this question is the focus of salvation history. The answer to this question is the focus of world history. And finally, the answer to this question is the focus of your personal history. Jesus asks, who do people say that the Son of Man is? What do you think, guys? Who is he? But he's setting them up so that he can pivot. They give their answers, well, John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, maybe some random prophet out there. But then Jesus gets to the point he really wanted to make. All right, that's nice. But what about you? What about you, Peter? Who do you say that I am? Jesus knows that the answer to the question is about salvation history. Jesus knows that the answer to the question is about world history, but he's not interested in the world at that moment. He's interested in one heart, one soul, one man, Peter. Jesus takes the most important question in the world and he turns it on you. You, right here today, listening to this. And he asks you, as he asks Peter so many thousands of years ago, who do you say that I am? Well, who do you say that I am? There are a lot of wrong answers. There are a lot of close answers, but only one answer will do, and you better get this one right. Well, this religious thing just isn't, it's not my thing. I'm here with my parents, can't wait to leave, feel a little uncomfortable right now. That's not the right answer. 
I think Jesus is awesome. I think Jesus rocks. I think Jesus is great. He's a great teacher, traditional values. I'm all for that. Oh, that's so close. That's so close. You are going to find one day to your heartbreak that close is no cigar on the most important question in the world. I made a decision, actually just right in front of where you're standing, preacher. I made a decision there for Jesus a long time ago. I go to Sunday school. I give a lot. Oh, I'm so glad about all those things. You could do a lot worse. It's not the right answer to the most important question. Jesus does not say to Peter, hey, Peter, would you do me a favor and catalog for me your religious history? I'm really interested in your spiritual autobiography. That's not what he says. Right now, today, this moment, who do you say that I am? So, who do you say that he is? Wrong answers walk. Close answers don't count. There's only one right answer. And everything about who you are and everything about your future depends on it. The only right answer, the answer on which your eternal soul depends, is the one right answer, Jesus. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Let's stand and let's pray. Father, there is one question that will control the destiny of every single person in the sound of my voice. And it is the question, who is Jesus? Father, to answer that question right, Jesus tells us that we have to have your help. And so I'm asking for you to open the hearts of people who have wrong and close answers and show them by a miraculous gift of your grace that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Father, I'm asking for my friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ who are, who are trusting in Jesus as the Christ, as the Son of the living God, that you would comfort them and help them, that you would draw near to them and watch over them. Father, I am asking that in our day, you would help us to see you build your church. Brick by brick, person by person, we want to see you do a work so that Jesus would build his church and so that we could see it and be a part of it. Father, we ask that you'd show it to us even now. Work now. Open hearts now. Let us see people now confess Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. We pray it in his name. Amen.